Hello, we are on lesson three of Bible 101, part two, Jesus' teachings. We're going to look at one of my favorite parables. We'll look at the first part of the parable. It's maybe one you know. We sometimes call it the prodigal son or the lost son. There's really two sons there. We're going to focus on the first one today. In Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 24, we'll read that and comment on it, and then we'll come back and go through the questions that are on the study guide that you should have received or been able to download from our web from our website so luke chapter 15 beginning with verse 11 you can find that on page 714. so a parable is kind of a one of the ways we talk about it is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning so jesus is going to tell a story but it's going to relate to who we are and who God is, and he's going to tell us the kind of God that we have. So he's telling this story, this parable, parable of the lost son. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. All right, pause there. Here's the story. Give me my share of the estate. When does a person usually get their inheritance? After their parent dies. So he's really saying, Father, you're better to me dead than you are alive. Let's cut to the chase. Let's get over with it. Give me my inheritance now. I want it on my terms. And what is shocking is that the father does it. He divided his property between them. He probably had to sell off land to be able to do this. The second son, this younger son, would have in that culture gotten about one-third of the estate, the older son, two-thirds. So what does he do? Verse 13, not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am, starving to death? I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. Pause there a second. So he's got his, his repentance speech figured out. He's sorry for what he's done. He is far away in a distant country and he comes to his senses and he he thinks, I'll never be part of this family again, but maybe dad will be able to give me a job. Make me like one of your hired men. So he starts walking back, and he doesn't know how his father's going to react. Let's see what happens. So second part of verse 20. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and put sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he was found. So they began to celebrate. This is, this is God's word. This is what he says. Let's look at some of our questions. Number one says, after demanding his inheritance from his father, what does the young man then do with this inheritance? Squanders it, wastes it, spends it on, on wild living. He spends everything, and where does he do it? In a distant country, a foreign country. Oh, number two, why do you think he went to a distant country to live that way? Makes sense, doesn't it? If you're going to live a, a wild life that your parents, that your God wouldn't approve of, that your neighbors wouldn't approve of, you don't want to stay where you were. 
it's no fun to go and snort a line of coke and get wasted and bring home a prostitute and, and then see dad watching you come in in the evening. That'd just ruin all the fun. He goes to a distant country to get away from his dad and probably to try to get away from that accusing conscience that says you're living in a way that is wrong. He tries to do it, but he can't do it for long because he, he runs out of all, all of his money. He would have been better off staying with his father, but God's going to use this too to turn him back around and to bring him back. And there's a spiritual truth there that sometimes we need, we feel like we need God the most when we're off in a distant country. Maybe you've been there. Maybe in some ways you feel like you're there now. God lets us see his need for him. Number three, when the inheritance runs out and the famine hits the region, the young man has to find a job. There's no food growing. He's slopping the pigs. What does he long to do? He longs to fill his stomach with the, the, the junk that the pigs are eating. He's at rock bottom. Number four, finally he decides to go back. Why do you think that would be hard for the young man to do? You think of the amount of shame he would have brought his family by taking his estate and leaving. And now he thinks maybe he can go back there. He's gonna have to swallow his pride. He's gonna have to repent and turn away and, and say he was wrong for what he did, and that is hard to do. Yeah, I mean, he imagines probably coming back and, and seeing his dad standing there. Hey, son, how much is left of that inheritance that I gave you? Nothing? Nothing at all? But was it worth it? It'd be hard to come back, but would it be worth it? Yeah. Hard to admit the sin, yes, but worth it. In verse 20, we see the father's reaction. What was it? Describe it. Look at verse 20. This just almost brings tears to my eyes. It's so beautiful. So he, he's a long way off. He hasn't had a chance to say his repentance speech that he'd worked up yet. He goes off to find his father, but while he was a long way off, his father saw him. What does that tell you about his father? He's watching. He's waiting. Maybe every day just watching for a figure to appear, appear on that hill for his son to come home. And he doesn't come up and say, how could you do this? You've got some explaining to do. Instead, he runs and fathers in this culture in this time period didn't run. <laughs> Women and children maybe ran, but the dignified father didn't. But he pulls up his robe and he goes running to his son. He's filled with compassion. He throws his arms around him and kisses him. And then his, his son starts his repentance speech, but his father doesn't even let him finish. Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Whose robe do you think that is? It's the father's robe. Put sandals on his feet, bring the fattened calf and kill it. It's a celebration. Put a ring on his finger. He was dead, but he's alive. He was lost and he's found. They begin to celebrate. Puts a ring on his finger, probably a signet ring that would have had the family crest, the family seal on it, where you could go and, and melt some wax and make official business transactions on behalf of the family and put the seal on it, or really... The son at this time, how much of a part of the family is he now? 100%. He's back. If he wanted to sell the farm again, could he do it? Yeah, probably. How many strings does the father attach to the son's forgiveness? None. How much groveling does he have to do first to make sure that he's really sorry? None. What do you think? Was the young man forgiven before he even came home? He was. The father was waiting. He'd already forgiven him. An important spiritual truth to know, forgiveness depends on the heart of the one doing the forgiving. The son didn't know that he'd been forgiven yet. He didn't have access to all those blessings in the same way until his father said that, but he was forgiven. 
No conditions. In number six, it says, yeah, in forgiving his son, how many conditions did the father attach? None. How many conditions does God put on us for his forgiveness? None. Takes that ring and puts it on our finger and says, you're part of the family. You are my son. You are my daughter. You are welcome here. I've been waiting for you. You're forgiven. So yeah, what's a, well, maybe number seven, the young man represents us. Gone, gone far away, fallen into sin. The Father represents God. What does God want us to learn about him from this section of scripture? Lots of things. Here's some you could jot down. And maybe you can think of some more on top of this. Um, well, what's God willing to forgive? All of our sins. Every single one. No conditions, because Jesus died on the cross and he rose from the dead. And we'll learn about more of that next, next lesson, how Jesus forgave our sins. Um, we can expect that we're going to mess it up. And there's forgiveness. And Jesus loves you and cares about you. So think about what, what else you learn about God from this section. It's good, isn't it?